Hello and welcome to Astronomy with Mr Gerin. This is part two of a four-part series on the solar system. If you haven't already, I recommend you watch part one first. In this video, we look at the planets and dwarf planets, as well as the size of the solar system. We'll then consider some of the most distant parts of the solar system, the Kuiper Belt, the Oort Cloud, and finally the Heliosphere. There are a lot of numbers given in this video. Since this series is focused on the Astronomy GCSE, we'll use the rounded values given by the GCSE course. You may find slightly different numbers elsewhere. There's no need to memorise these numbers. Professional astronomers will always have a cheat sheet nearby, and the GCSE exam includes all the figures you'll need in a neat table at the front. In part one, you learned about the astronomical unit, the mean distance from the Earth to the Sun, about 150 million, or 1.5 times 10 to the 8, kilometres. We'll use the AU a lot in this video when discussing distances. I'm sure you've seen pictures like this before. It shows the planets in order, but they're far too close to each other. Let's give them some realistic distances. This shows the planets at their correct distances from the Sun, scaled down with their distances given in astronomical units. But the sizes aren't to scale. And of course, we don't really see the planets perfectly lined up like this. Now let's see the planets drawn to scale. Here, I've labelled the planets with their diameter, or twice their radius. We can barely fit two and a half Jupiters on screen from top to bottom, while Mercury is just 16 pixels wide. On the other hand, we can only see a tiny fraction of the enormous Sun. A proper two-scale picture of the solar system, with accurate sizes and distances, would show the Sun about one pixel wide, and at HD resolution, the planets wouldn't be visible at all. You can see a to-scale picture of the solar system every clear night. We don't see enormous planets in the night sky, despite what science fiction movies would have us believe. To see the planets in detail, we need telescopes or spacecraft. Now, let's look at each of the planets. I'll discuss various details that you don't need to learn for the GCSE, but are really interesting. You're expected to know the names of the planets, their order in terms of size, temperature and distance from the Sun, and whether they have moons or rings. But, as I said, you don't need to memorise all of this. Exam questions are likely to be comparisons, such as calculating how many times more massive Jupiter is than the Earth. First up, the smallest planet and the closest to the Sun, Mercury. Mercury has quite an unusual orbit. It is the most eccentric planet and at perihelion reaches just two-thirds of its distance at aphelion. It also has something called a 3-2 spin orbit resonance. This is a peculiar type of tidal locking. It rotates three times for every two orbits. The effect is that a day on Mercury lasts for two Mercury years. If you look at the picture here, you'll understand why people often mistake Mercury for the Moon. It's not much bigger, and it has almost no atmosphere, leading it to become pockmarked by meteorite impacts over time. In the very long days, Mercury's surface reaches 427 degrees Celsius, while during the long night it plummets to minus 173. Mercury's mass is just 0.055 times Earth's mass. Edexcel's cheat sheet had a typo, giving it as 0.55. I informed them and they fixed it for the most recent exams. Venus is often called Earth's twin due to its similar size and mass, but the similarities end there. Venus has an extremely dense atmosphere, with surface atmospheric pressure 92 times that of Earth, probably from volcanic eruptions. The atmosphere is mostly carbon dioxide, causing a very strong greenhouse effect, which has made Venus the hottest planet in the solar system, even hotter than Mercury's daytime, despite being further from the Sun. Venus's atmosphere is toxic to Earth-based life in many different ways, and the rain is not water, but sulfuric acid. The wind can reach 300 kilometres per hour. If you want to die in a variety of horrible ways, I can recommend no better place. However, there have been occasional indications of possible life. When astronomers first made out Venus's cloudy atmosphere, it was assumed it was a hot, tropical jungle, like Earth's rainforests. And more recently, phosphine gas was detected in the atmosphere, which led scientists to suggest microbes might be floating in the dense clouds. Sadly, further analysis indicates this detection may have been faulty. Earth, the birthplace of all known life. 
except a few jellyfish, rats and other small animals, taken on space missions as experiments. Earth has liquid water on the surface. It's very tectonically active and the surface continually reshapes itself with volcanoes, earthquakes and tectonic drift. Earth's atmosphere is 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen and 1% argon, with trace amounts of other gases and a varying amount of water. The atmosphere protects life, keeping it warm and shielding the surface from harmful radiation and meteorite impacts. We have one moon which is over a quarter the size of Earth, the largest moon proportionally compared to its planet in the solar system. The moon plays a crucial role in our tides and stabilises the Earth's orbit and rotation. The Earth's rotation is tilted by 23.5 degrees to its orbital plane. This is the cause of our seasons. For more detailed information, see my separate video on the Earth. Like many planets, the Earth has a magnetic field, similar to a simple bar magnet caused by electric currents in the rotating liquid iron-nickel outer core. For historic reasons, the North Pole is actually a magnetic South Pole, and the South Pole is a magnetic North Pole. The Earth's magnetic field is strongly affected by the solar wind, which I discuss in The Sun Part 2. This gives the magnetic field a distinctive shape and structure, different from a normal bar magnet, called the magnetosphere. The magnetosphere extends about 65,000 kilometres towards the Sun. In the other direction, the solar wind stretches it out about 10 times as far. This region is called the magnetotail, and even surrounds the Moon at full Moon. You don't need to know every part of the magnetosphere for the GCSE, but you should know the Van Allen belts. These are two regions of charged particles circling the Earth, just like in particle accelerators such as CERN. The inner belt, shown here in red, contains mostly protons. The outer belt, shown in blue, is mostly electrons. These high-energy charged particles act as hazardous ionising radiation to any spacecraft travelling through them. Uncrewed spacecraft passing through the Van Allen belts must be hardened, designed to withstand the radiation without risking damage to delicate circuitry. Astronauts generally don't go high enough to worry about the Van Allen belts. But the Apollo astronauts did. They flew very fast through lower density regions of the belts to minimise their exposure to the dangerous radiation. Mars is the most hospitable planet in the solar system apart from Earth. That doesn't mean it's a nice place to live, but you could survive on the surface with a spacesuit. Mars used to have liquid water on its surface. Most of this is now locked up as ice in the polar ice caps and underground. The atmosphere, which is mostly carbon dioxide, is too thin to permit water these days, except, we think, for occasional brief periods at very low heights. Mars has two tiny moons, Phobos and Deimos, fear and panic. Their mass is too low for them to have formed spherical shapes, and they were probably asteroids, captured by Mars's gravity. Five robotic rovers have explored Mars, and two, Curiosity and Perseverance, are still going. We might well send humans to Mars in the next decade or so. These planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth and Mars, are called terrestrial planets, which means Earth-like. They are also called rocky planets, or inner planets, because they orbit inside the main asteroid belt. Jupiter is the largest planet in the solar system, with two and a half times the mass of all the other planets combined. Its enormous gravity affects the other planets strongly, even completely disrupting the formation of a would-be planet in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. Jupiter has four major moons, the Galileo moons discovered by Galileo Galilei, Ganymede, Callisto, Europa and Io, as well as at least 75 smaller moons. Jupiter rotates extremely fast, once every 10 hours. It has a liquid metallic hydrogen core and as the core rotates so quickly, it generates an extremely strong magnetic field. This magnetic field shields the four major moons from the solar wind, protecting their atmospheres. Jupiter is a gas giant. It is thought to have no solid surface, but as the atmospheric pressure increases near the centre, gases condense into liquids. The atmosphere is 75% hydrogen and 24% helium, with the remainder made of various elements and molecules. At the visible surface, we can see clear belts of different colours. 
These are part of the atmosphere with different compositions, travelling across Jupiter at speeds up to 360 km per hour. Jupiter is also home to the Great Red Spot. This is a storm larger than any other in the solar system, even larger than the Earth, and has been raging since it was first spotted 200 years ago, and possibly even longer. Saturn, also called the Ringed Planet. All four giant planets have rings, but Saturn's are easily the most spectacular. The other planet's rings were discovered in 1977 and later by visiting spacecraft, but you can see Saturn's rings with the cheapest telescope, and Galileo first saw them in 1610. Saturn's rings are almost entirely chunks of ice, with a tiny amount of rock. The particles range from a few micrometers to several meters, and the rings are generally less than a kilometre thick. There are many separate rings, with gaps in between them. They have a clear structure, which is maintained by shepherd moons. Shepherd moons orbit in gaps between the rings. They clear out a gap for their orbit, and their gravity pulls drifting particles back into place tidying the rings into neat circles with sharp edges. Like Jupiter, Saturn is a gas giant, but unlike Jupiter, it has a small solid rocky core. Around the solid core is liquid metallic hydrogen, which generates a magnetic field as it spins. Saturn's atmosphere is similar to Jupiter's, hydrogen and helium with small amounts of other elements and molecules. Jupiter and Saturn both have phosphine gas, but unlike the possible phosphine on Venus, we understand how it forms in the gas giant's high pressures and temperatures. Saturn has a distinct yellow colour, caused by ammonia crystals in its upper atmosphere. And lastly, my favourite feature of Saturn, at its north pole is a storm in the shape of a hexagon. Uranus is an ice giant. It was the first planet discovered by telescope by William Herschel in 1781 with help from his sister Caroline. Although it is occasionally visible to the naked eye, in good conditions if you know where to look. Like Jupiter and Saturn, Uranus's upper atmosphere is mostly hydrogen and helium, but with a lot more methane. However, most of the planet is made of ices. In planetary science, an ice is any substance with a relatively high freezing point, not just water. Ices in Uranus include water, ammonia and methane. When Uranus was formed, these substances were frozen, Uranus has a hot mantle where some of them have melted, but they're still referred to as ices. Beneath the mantle is a solid rocky core of silicate and iron nickel compounds. Uranus is closer to the Sun than Neptune, so it's slightly warmer, on average. But Uranus holds the record for the lowest temperature ever recorded on any planet. We're not sure why. Uranus is the most tilted of all the planets. Its axial tilt is 98 degrees, passed sideways. We think this is from a collision with an Earth-sized protoplanet three or four billion years ago. Note that Venus is arguably more tilted than Uranus. It has a tilt of three degrees, but it spins backwards, so sometimes it's said to be tilted 177 degrees. Uranus, like all the giant planets, has rings. They're very thin and dark and hard to see. They're likely rock and dust from a shattered moon, and if you can get to them, Uranus is a diamond mine. Near the core, an ocean of liquid diamond holds up floating diamond bergs, and solid diamonds rain through the atmosphere. Our last planet, Neptune, is another ice giant, smaller but more massive than Uranus. Neptune was the first planet to be discovered mathematically. Scientists had seen unusual changes to Uranus's orbit, and proposed that it was being perturbed by the gravity of an unknown planet. Urban Leverrier calculated the position of this new planet, and Johann Galle found it with a telescope in 1846. Neptune's structure is very similar to Uranus, and both look blue because of methane in the upper atmosphere. However, Neptune looks more visually interesting, with obvious bands and clouds. And Neptune has the strongest winds in the solar system, reaching 2,100 km per hour. Neptune has a very faint ring system, thought to be ice particles coated with silicon or carbon compounds, giving them a dark reddish colour. Beyond Neptune's orbit is the Kuiper Belt, a region similar to the asteroid belt, which we'll discuss shortly. Jupiter's gravity shapes the asteroid belt, and Neptune rules the Kuiper Belt. The most famous Kuiper Belt resident is Pluto. Pluto has a very eccentric orbit, which means that while it usually stays further away from the Sun than Neptune, 
it occasionally comes closer. However, Neptune's gravity keeps Pluto in a 2-3 orbital resonance. For every three orbits of Neptune, Pluto completes two orbits. This ensures that they will never collide. We'll discuss orbital resonance further in part four. Jupiter and Saturn are called gas giants. Uranus and Neptune are called ice giants. And together, these four planets are called giant planets. Now we'll move on to the dwarf planets, starting with Ceres. Astronomers have noticed a suspiciously large gap between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter, and hypothesised a planet between them. In 1801, they found their missing planet. Ceres was later deemed too small, and was reclassified as an asteroid. In 2006, it became a dwarf planet. Some people mistakenly think Ceres changed from an asteroid to a dwarf planet. In fact, it's both. Ceres is slightly less than 1,000 kilometres across, and contains about a quarter of the mass of the asteroid belt. It's the only asteroid to have enough mass and gravity to have pulled itself into a spherical shape. Ceres is geologically active, with a thick crust of ice, salts and other minerals on top of a briny layer of mud and an inner icy mineral-rich mantle. We don't know if it has a solid core. Ceres doesn't have a proper atmosphere, but it does have an exosphere, a very small amount of water vapour, which gets quickly blown away by the solar wind and occasionally a cryovolcano, an ice volcano, erupts on the surface. Pluto was discovered by Clyde Tombaugh in 1930, and was classified as a planet until dwarf planets were defined in 2006. Its orbit is beyond Neptune's, but is very eccentric, occasionally bringing it closer to the Sun. Its orbit is also highly inclined at 17 degrees, taking it far above and below the ecliptic. Pluto's large solid core is silicate rock. Above that is a liquid water ocean, surrounded by an icy crust. The surface is mostly frozen nitrogen, which has partially evaporated, creating a very thin nitrogen atmosphere with a small amount of methane and carbon dioxide. Pluto seems to be geologically active. In some regions, its surface is only 200,000 years old, with no visible impact craters. Pluto has five moons. The largest, Charon, is more than half the size of Pluto, and the two are tidally locked, meaning that the same sides of Pluto and Charon always face each other. Objects with orbits past Neptune, such as Pluto, are called transneptunian objects, or TNOs. Three more of these are dwarf planets, Haumea, Makimaki, and Eris. I won't tell you much about them, because we don't know much. They're so distant and have never been visited by spacecraft that we don't even have good photos of them, only these artists' impressions. So, these are the five dwarf planets. Note that they're not officially planets, so the name dwarf planet is a bit misleading. They would be planets, but they haven't cleared the neighbourhood around their orbits. All five official dwarf planets except Ceres are transneptunian objects. There are a few more candidate dwarf planets, and possibly thousands of others. For some reason, Maki Maki isn't mentioned in the Astronomy GCSE. Finally today, we'll look at the distant solar system. Beyond Neptune's orbit lies the Kuiper Belt, extending from 30 AU to over 100 AU. The Kuiper Belt is similar to the asteroid belt, but much larger. It lies close to the ecliptic and contains millions of small icy bodies, with lots of frozen water, methane and ammonia. Short period comets with orbital periods less than 200 years, come from here. Kuiper belt objects usually have fairly circular orbits, but sometimes Neptune's gravity disturbs them, pulling them in towards the Sun. Short period comets come from the ecliptic or close to it, so their inclination is typically small. Much further out is the Oort cloud. Although it has not yet been directly observed, it's our best explanation for the origin of long period comets. The Oort cloud extends from about 5,000 AU to as much as 200,000 AU, more than halfway to our neighbouring star, Proxima Centauri. The Oort cloud is made of icy bodies, similar to the Kuiper belt. But it's not just a disk. The Oort cloud is a spherical shell, surrounding our solar system in all directions. At this distance, objects orbit the Sun extremely slowly and their motion can easily be disrupted by nearby passing stars. This might send them out of the solar system, 
or hurl them towards the inner solar system, where they may appear as long-period comets. Such comets have periods longer than 200 years, and often millions of years. This very not-to-scale diagram shows typical orbits of short and long-period comets. Most Kuiper Belt and Oort Cloud objects don't come anywhere near the Sun, and only those with highly eccentric orbits come close enough to be seen, even with a telescope. As we saw in part one, objects travel fastest at periapsis, where they're closest to the body they're orbiting, the Sun for comets. Comets spend most of their time moving very slowly in the Kuiper Belt or Oort Cloud, only visiting the inner solar system for a short time. When they come near the planets, especially Jupiter, their orbits can be perturbed. For instance, a comet might come in with a 10,000 year orbit, and return from its trip past the planets with a 50,000 year orbit, or even leave the solar system altogether. And we'll finish today with the most distant part of the solar system, the heliosphere. Essentially, this is the Sun's atmosphere. The solar wind blows a huge distance into space, about 100 AU. Beyond this is interstellar space, where we can't distinguish the Sun's matter from that of other stars. The Sun is travelling through the Milky Way at about 700,000 km per hour, distorting the heliosphere into a shape similar to that of a comet, with a long tail. Many astronomers call it cigar-shaped. Did you notice that the Oort cloud is in interstellar space? Defining the size of the solar system is tricky. Some people say it's 30 AU, the size of Neptune's orbit. Some say it's 100 AU, the size of the heliosphere. And some say it's 1 to 200,000 AU, to the edge of the Oort cloud. And that's it for this video. In part 3, we'll look at how we've explored the solar system. And in part 4, we'll consider how it formed, and how gravity still affects it today. Thank you for watching. Goodbye and have an excellent day.